Welcome to the Living After Faith Podcast, a podcast designed to help you as you leave religion and move forward with your life. We're the official podcast of RecoveringReligionist.com, a recovery group founded by Dr. Daryl Ray, the author of The God Virus. We welcome your feedback. You can contact us by going to LivingAfterFaith.com at Facebook.com slash LivingAfterFaith and follow us on Twitter at LAF with me. That's Laugh With Me. And now today's program on Living After Faith, a bit of a different show, and I first apologize for the sound quality. We did an interview with uh, Candace Gorham. You may have heard her in our last episode, but she also interviewed Deanna for a project she's working on called The Ebony Exodus. So what we've done is we're publishing that as a podcast. It's Skype, it's got some noise in it, but you know, it's a great conversation between these two amazing ladies, and I think you're going to really love it. It's a longer podcast, but I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, the process of getting it ready for publication, and I think you'll enjoy it too. So without anything else from me, here are the ladies, Deanna Joy Lyons and Candace Gorham. I guess I'll just tell you a little bit about what I'm doing. Um, Really, um, my project, it's called Ebony Exodus, and I'm trying to um, get some more information, and I would like to turn it into a book. I'm doing just mostly research right now Cool. um, about black women who have come out of religion. Mm -hmm. Um, And, of course, I'm finding it hard to find women. I mean, I've got plenty on Facebook, but I can't seem to find any where I live yeah, and um, so I'm kind of starting to branch out and I'm starting to maybe reconceptualize exactly what my project will look like and it may have to be more along the lines of black women plus all women (laughs) Um, (laughs) I feel you you know it's we've been actually trying actively to find more women and minorities to interview on the podcast because you probably noticed like the first like interviews that we did it was all white guy white guy white guy (laughs) and uh so you know that's been a bit of a struggle but we kind of just started out with um people that we knew from you know the seattle atheist group or the meetups and stuff so it kind of you know in that sense all the physical meetup groups especially in an area like seattle it's you end up you all you have is white dudes because that's who goes to these meetups you know right right yeah but um there's some cool lists that have been going around uh jen mccrate made a big list of female atheists and okay. you know she put people like jamila bay on there and uh-huh. uh you know you got greta christina and then greta christina made a list of awesome minority atheists so all like all sorts of people now i've been looking at that list going okay how can i make friends with these people and interview them so um if i can find the list i'll email them to you but you might just be able to search like greta christina's list um i'll do that yeah she's she is awesome right well i um i had emailed i I guess i don't know maybe I, like for example I emailed Jamila Bay mm-hmm. she's on my Facebook um, and there's another girl who's doing a lot of stuff called Ayana Watson mm-hmm. and uh, I've emailed her as well and neither one of them got back to me so I guess I need to try again I, mean, I know they're both you know pretty busy and really active in the whole you know new movement and also right. they may be hard to get in touch with yeah you know it's really surprising who you can get though like if you just try like we we got david silverman just on a freaking fluke like yeah rich was friends with him on facebook and i'm not sure rich even realized like who it was that he was friending uh-huh. like whether you know the request came in from the other end or if it was a suggestion or whatever but i was looking uh-huh. over his shoulder one day and i see his news feed and i go it says like david silverman changed his profile picture and i was like holy holy crap you're friends with david silverman he goes uh-huh. yeah yeah who's that i go the president of american atheist you retard god <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. i know so you know and, the, and i said you should just like see if we could talk to him on the podcast mm-hmm. and he goes okay and he sends a message and he says sure i'll come on your podcast whatever you right. want you know like wow so yeah so it's, it's really great how everybody just kind of um you know you tell them you have a project you're working on and they immediately they're like oh i'll do anything do you want me to type it for you you're like oh yeah i love you thanks (laughs) yeah i mean definitely i you know it seems like i'm learning that more and more people are excited about you know furthering the cause i guess so to speak Mm -hmm. you know i'm willing to speak up and you know that kind of thing yeah yeah it's it's very cool right 
Well, let me just ask you a couple of basic. Sure. I, mean, I just want to get, you know, some demographic information. How old are you? 31. And you guys live in Seattle, right? That's correct. Okay. And what's your highest education level? Uh, I have a high school degree that I got via GED. Okay. All right. And then what field? I know you got, you work, you do com uh, the radio. Mm hmm Yeah, oh. I'm a traffic reporter. So I guess, you know, if you, if you need like a classification um mm -hmm. i don't know what do they call me like a voice voice talent or i don't know uh -huh. um, radio performer uh, <laughs> <laughs> well you know i've always thought you had just the most gorgeous voice so i can see why oh thank you so much you're so sweet uh -huh. <laughs> it's weird because so i'm on in the middle of the night so like nobody nobody really listens but people <laughs> sometimes you know they, they'll like i'll get facebook messages from people i've known forever and they're like I think I heard you on the radio. You don't do the radio, do you? Uh -huh. And I'm like, yes, I do. And they go, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's funny. Mm -hmm. So, and this, I know you're married now. Is this your first marriage? It marriage? is. All right. And you don't have any kids? Nope. Nope. All right. Cool. Um, well, basically, my, my project is, basically, I've just kind of got a few um, broad topics. And I just pretty much listen to you and let you talk about them. Okay. Um, and so my first question is really just about your um, religious upbringing and, you know, that background, just trying to get some ideas of what that was like. Okay. Well, I um, I had sort of a, a mix. Like, my father was a big fan of uh, Carl Sagan. He had Isaac Asimov around, like, giant bookshelves full of, of sci-fi and, uh, and a lot of nonfiction sci-fi stuff, um, mm -hmm. or sci, I guess you would call it, <laughs> with the no fi in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then my mom made us go to church every Sunday up until I was about, gosh, I think it was probably 12 by the time, you know, they, she realized like they couldn't wrestle me out of bed anymore. <laughs> you know, like, okay, you're too big to like physically drag and throw some, you know, dress over your head. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was a, a United Methodist church, which mm -hmm. to be honest, that's one of those flavors of Christianity. Like I've been learning more about all the different kinds there are um, since, you know, becoming more, more active with the atheist movement. Mm -hmm. And I still like don't really know the difference between like what does the Methodist do that's different from a Lutheran that's different mm -hmm. from uh, you know I, the, about the only differences I can see are the are like the major um, the major things like the, the evangelicals and the um, and the Fred Phelps is like the more extreme stuff I'm like okay I get what you guys believe but I don't know what's different between exactly. the Methodists and yeah, the, the Catholics seem to have the same exact beliefs as those people, only they have fancier clothes. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, I burped. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, uh, I always had these like these grave like misgivings as a kid. Mm -hmm. I was always very serious when mm -hmm. when we're sitting in church and I would sit and I'd think too much. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you probably understand that. That's a very common problem with women. It's like mm -hmm. we think too much. So mm -hmm. you're sitting in church, you're listening to a sermon, and you're either so bored that mm -hmm. you're just like thinking about other things, or or maybe you start like thumbing through the hymnals, and you know, for a while there was, sometimes I would go to the Sunday school, um, mm -hmm. little class down in the basement, and I remember like sitting there, and and I'm in the Sunday school class and they're talking about, you know, whatever the usual BS, the Noah's mm -hmm. Ark or Daniel <laughs> and the lion or, you mm -hmm. know, and they're going, you know, they're just talking about this stuff and I'm thinking to myself, I don't understand why I have to be here and like <laughs> get up all early on a Sunday morning and wear clothes that I hate and mm -hmm. sit around a table with a bunch of like kids that I don't know and don't give a crap about. <laughs> when i mean there's no such thing as god i don't know why we're here mm. and you know at, at the time i think i i thought everybody just kind of went along with this like it was mm -hmm. some sort of big like 
like Santa Claus, you mm-hmm. know, everybody pretends Santa Claus is real for the sake of those that still do believe Santa Claus is real, like the little mm-hmm. kids. Mm-hmm. And you don't give it away, otherwise you're going to get spanked because you just mm-hmm. ruined the surprise for the other kids, you know? And mm-hmm. I thought maybe maybe that's what God is like. Maybe that's mm-hmm. everybody just sort of acts like this is real. But of mm-hmm. course, now I've found out people really do believe. Holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> do they? So yeah. you started thinking about God's not real as early as 12? I think I was about nine. I, oh, you know, wow. I remember being, being pretty, like my feet didn't reach the floor. Mm. And, and it's, I don't know, that's just an age that kind of sticks in my brain. It, it could have been, you know, earlier or later, but. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, so and I think what? it was the science that was all around me, like in the mm-hmm. in the house, like made me start thinking, like you know, this stuff doesn't make sense, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's one thing that I keep hearing more and more people talk about is uh, once they really started to build their critical thinking skills, mm-hmm. that, that you know that that's when things became more. There was that that cognitive dissonance began to grow. Yeah. Yeah, I th- I think that is a huge part of it. You know, something mm-hmm. we've heard a lot from people that we've interviewed too. I'm sure you've noticed is they say things that like, you know, it didn't make sense that somebody who was a good person would still go to hell if they didn't mm-hmm. believe the right thing, or it didn't make sense that the earth was only you know six thousand years old, or mm-hmm. you know. And, and my church wasn't real literal, and they weren't real scary. They weren't like you know mm-hmm. screaming about hell all the time, mm-hmm. but you know. I, I can't put my finger on any specific doctrines that bothered me, mm-hmm. but, you know, the stories of hell were scary. And, you know, even though they didn't scream about it all the time, they were, of course, it's still there. You know, you're around, you're around that stuff. And, and to think that a guy like died and came back to life three days later when that never mm-hmm. happens now, and we have really good medical care in, in, in our mm-hmm. society or, you know that this dude up in the sky is seriously concerned like about every thought you have you know mm-hmm. that seemed like it seemed wrong and mm-hmm. you know now that i'm older i know like th- there's like an abusive relationship sort of thing going on with the idea of god but at the time it just all seemed like a little weird it just didn't it didn't mm-hmm. make sense it wasn't it, it didn't it didn't seem real mm-hmm. yeah. um so how long i mean did you continue to uh well i guess at 12 you were you were feeling like or maybe even earlier that there was no god so yeah, i mean I did you going to church as soon as i could get away with like not going to church you know that preteen right. sort of age and it, yeah. you know it wasn't that i was getting away with it it was that my mom like got tired of the screaming fights and uh-huh. She started going through her own thing. Um, her and my dad ended up separating a little, little after that, about a mm-hmm. year or two, and uh, they've actually they've been separated ever since for like seventeen oh. years, which is kind but of, not officially divorced. <laughs> not officially divorced, which is kind of weird. But yeah. hey, it's my parents. What do you do? Um, yeah. And it was like she just got tired of having like these big like yelling matches every mm-hmm. Sunday morning. I'd be like, No, I'm not going. I hate that place, and mm-hmm. not getting dressed and. And wearing stuff I hate and going to hang out with like all the yuppies that, you know, mm. just all like are, are all better than me or whatever. No. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, she got tired of fighting and she just started going on her own. Mm-hmm. So. Well, I know I remember hearing you talking about um, some of the kind of sexual or oh, well, some of the psychological, I guess, drama. Mm-hmm. that that you felt around sexual issues so w- tell me some more about that because i mean did that continue those kind of thoughts were into your teens is that what it was mm-hmm. i mean despite the um the fact that i i didn't believe in god for you know quite a long time these these social messages um all around women have you know these conflicting uh absolutes being thrown mm-hmm. at them the one absolute is you must be pure and and mm-hmm. innocent and and not sexually aggressive and not really into sex. And then mm-hmm. the other absolute is that you have to be hot and you mm-hmm. have to be mm-hmm. sexual and you have to be desired. And so, you know, these messages uh, at the time, like as a teenage as a teenager, it was probably around thirteen when I was like, 
my hormones were raging. I mean, mm-hmm. I was the horniest thing you probably ever <laughs> saw. And, uh-huh. You know, I was, I was, I had these great, great desires. And I was like, you know, and there, there were these two, two messages bouncing mm-hmm. around in my head. And I would think about it a lot. I would go, you know, why can't I? have Mm -hmm. sexual relations with somebody I like and I didn't have a boyfriend or anything so it was all Mm -hmm. kind of academic but you know like what's so wrong with masturbation what's so wrong Mm -hmm. with thinking these things and and wanting to do them and then of course you know and I would say well it's just the man trying to keep me down you know because I was 13 (laughs) I was all defiant I was like screw you the man Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, it was it was so hard because then I'm like you know I'm, I'm an awkward nerdy glasses wearing like geek who Mm -hmm. did really well on spelling tests and Mm -hmm. you know and so I ended up starting hanging with kind of like the rough crowd you know we would end up you know smoking pot or making out you know that Mm -hmm. kind of teenage you know minor transgressions I guess it Uh really would you would think of it now Uh Um, but you know, all my life, um, I've still got like hormones raging like crazy. I've mm-hmm. got a, a very strong sex drive, mm-hmm. and it took me forever to really be, you know, comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. To be able to admit that I love to fuck. I mm-hmm. love men. I love women. I mm-hmm. love masturbating. I love toys. I love mm-hmm. sex, mm-hmm. and. I have always had like this, you know, niggling guilt right in the back of the head. Like you are not supposed to do that. Or, you know, people would say things like, you know, well, the only reason you're like this is because your dad left your family when you were like a kid or, Mm -hmm. you know, you're just like screwed up and you don't know what's like, what's going on. You don't know what you want. You're just like responding to the messages of society. You know, Mm -hmm. everybody wants to make you feel like you're not in control of what you really want, what you feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's um, that's uh, kind of it's funny that you're saying you know talking about all that stuff because um, one of the interviews I just did the other day the girl and I just fell out laughing because we both had the same experience of thinking that we could masturbate under the blanket and God wouldn't see it. <laughs> oh, that's so adorable. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> so I mean, were you still having the like this kind of guilt into your twenties? Would you say? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't really, you know, get fully over it um, until probably like my late twenties. I was in a, a long-term relationship with a guy, and I was like, you know, I wasn't, but I was always pretty promiscuous. I mm-hmm. I loved to party. I loved you know people. I was always out meeting people and screwing them and you know mm-hmm. having a good time didn't hurt anybody didn't hurt myself and Mm -hmm. you know but I still always felt kind of bad Mm -hmm. and you know it I think what really helped actually was becoming more able to orgasm because Mm -hmm. like during sex because Mm -hmm. one of the things you, you really can't do is you can't take charge of your own pleasure like when you're having sex with a man you can't you know Unless, uh, unless of course you're you're both pretty enlightened, you can't touch mm-hmm. yourself and make yourself come while you're with them. You know, mm-hmm. they have to. It has to only be penis and vagina that mm-hmm. makes that happen, because that's the magical special. You know, mm-hmm. bits rubbing together, um, <laughs> and and that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, if I'd a, if I'd have known that it was okay, that it was not just okay but required, mm-hmm. um, I I would have spent more of my 20s enjoying myself between the sheets instead of leaving with them um, whatever the female equivalent of blue balls is mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, oh man why right. doesn't this ever work <laughs> uh-huh. yeah so that was it's almost like the it felt like kind of the religious as well as the social cultural messages that women get yeah. Are, this, are some of the things that contribute to the sexual dissatisfaction. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. And I think the social messages that we're getting are completely glued together to the religious. Mm-hmm. I, mm. I really don't think that they came from anywhere but the religious ideas about, you know, women being being pure and not, not uh, you know, being a property. Because, you know, it goes back to 
the very first chapter of the Bible is, mm -hmm. you know, Abraham and his virgins and his sister-in-law and his other sister-in-law and God, mm -hmm. who knows else, right? Everybody, mm -hmm. it's all like, and you have to be a virgin or you get stoned. And, mm -hmm. you know, nobody, nobody talks about what the man has to be in the mm -hmm. relationship. It's only what the woman must be. The woman must be subservient. She must be. And I really think it all kind of goes back to... Um, Maybe when people first start got it, started getting the idea that, you know, women and men make a baby uh, together and mm -hmm. you have to know who the woman has been with to know who the father is. And so uh -huh. if, she, if she has been with other people, you don't know that that's your kid and your kid is property. You know, it's not mm -hmm. about your love and your child together and blah, blah. It's that child is property. And so if right. that kid doesn't belong to you, you can kick it out into the desert. And, and right. try again. <laughs> I mean, which is horrible. Right, right. Um, I was I was telling my sister in law this weekend. Um, she still kind of uh, I don't know what she how what term to give her. Um, but she doesn't know very much about the Bible, but she still believes in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so when I kind of started telling her some of the things that you're saying about rape and that kind of stuff, what would happen to a woman? Right. I mean, she was just shocked. Yeah. And then instead of being interested in continuing the conversation, she just basically said, well, you know, I, I don't know that much about that. And it's really overwhelming. And so she just basically shut the conversation down yeah. instead of exploring it more. Yeah, she, you know, she sounds like, you know, maybe she doesn't kind of want to know, like she's not comfortable exploring right. it. And I don't blame her. I mean, you know, <laughs> when you like, when you're told your whole life that this thing you have to believe and everybody around you believes it, there's, you know, there's not a lot of detail. Like, you know, I mean, I went to that Methodist church and the Sunday school forever and ever, but nobody, you know, nobody ever really explains to you, this is exactly what our doctrine is and this is why, you know, mm -hmm. here's the scriptural support or here's the reason why we say this, you know, nobody ever goes into any of that evidence. So exactly. you have like whole, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who go to church every week and they don't know really what their church uh -huh. believes, what their church yeah. teaches, but they do know that they're by God is a God and that there is a Jesus and Jesus was God and God was Jesus. And then there's this other thing that's a spirit. And I'm not sure if they're three in one or they're just one that's three. And there's some stuff <laughs> exactly. like that. And this dude died and then he came back and Easter and Christmas. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's it. But it's very, those, those things, those are very strong. Yeah. 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 So did you have any other um, religious experiences outside of the, outside of the Methodist church? I did actually. Um, after around age 13, 14, I ended up getting kicked out of my parents' house. And mm. I uh, was out on the streets for a while, but like more of a couch surfing on the streets mm -hmm. than like, you know, gutter punking. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting caught uh, by the cops and put into, you know, the DSHS system. That's the Department okay. of Social and Health Services. You know, basically like, you know, the foster care system and all of that. Mm -hmm. And the the first place they put me was this house uh, these people lived in redmond very close to the uh methodist church that i went to as a kid mm -hmm. actually like walking distance and these people were um uh, like the the lady told me she said well these people are, are christians and they go to church every sunday and blah and i said listen, they're not going to make me go to their church with them, are they? Because I don't do that. I don't like that. I don't want to go to church. And mm -hmm. and the social worker said, oh, no, you don't have to. They they won't make you go to their church. They'll be fine. Well, mm -hmm. First thing they did was make me go to their church with them. Mm -hmm. So like, we can't leave you home alone in our house. You'll, you know, who knows what you'll do, blah, blah. Like, And that was like the first taste I got of the like hypocrisy of the uh the, the phrase Rich and I like to use is the uber godders, uh -huh. you know, because the first thing they tell you about themselves when you come into their house, the first thing they want you to know, and the thing that they stress constantly is how, like, super Christian they are. Mm -hmm. And they'll tell you, like, you know, I even remember some kind of self-serving BS, like, you know, we adopt children or foster children because, you know, that's what Christ should do and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And then... 
when I told them I wasn't going to go to their church, the guy yelled at me and then mm. told me that I couldn't stay there if I wasn't going to go to his church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is very loving and Christ-like and stuff. Yeah. So I left and mm. I said, screw this, I'm not going to be in this system. And I struck out on my own and I got caught um, mm -hmm. pretty soon after that. I think I was, I don't even remember now. I think I was like just walking down the street during school hours and like a cop car like rolled up and said, where are you? What are you doing? I was mm -hmm. like, I don't, I don't go to school. I just, um, I'm just right. taking a walk. Yeah, that's it. Um, so then they took me <laughs> to this <laughs> literally cockroach infested oh, wow. house in, um, the Rainier Valley, which is like, you know, pretty like way low income, real slummy area that, you know, everybody's always talking about the gang violence and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was this, this lady who had a couple of biological kids and mm -hmm. her and her kids lived upstairs mm -hmm. and me and like seven other girls in, in their teens lived in the basement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and wow. We, yeah. And the basement was like, it had like a door to the outside. So it was kind of a half daylight basement. Mm. You know, there were several bedrooms and crappy old mattresses. And mm. uh, the toilet kept overflowing. For some uh -huh. reason, the shower wouldn't work or maybe it leaked or something. And I was there for a week. And a couple of the girls told me that they went out and they, you know, they didn't use the words, but they, they told me they went out and prostituted out on the street, like down down the hill from this house they just like go mm -hmm. walking out there and, and I was like wow you know this place is messed up you'd see big cockroaches crawling around when mm. it was like breakfast lunch or dinner time the lady that that ran the house would you know give you like a paper or, or foam plate with a plastic fork and mm. it would be it was almost exactly like school lunch food. You know, that mm -hmm. crappy, like overcooked, super soft spaghetti that's nothing but yeah. tomato <laughs> sauce and noodles. You know, it would be that. And, you know, the first time she gives me a plate, the other everybody's going up for dinner. And I'm like, oh, it's dinner time. Where should I sit? And she goes, no, you eat down here. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay mm -hmm. then. So I was there for about a week and the the social worker like checked up on me or something so I didn't know how to get a hold of her or anything she goes well what do you think we we need to find another place for you because I know this isn't you know this is only for very temporary and mm -hmm. and I said I, I don't care just get me out of here this place is awful mm -hmm. and so they said well the only place we have is back with those uber goddars <laughs> I was like mm -hmm. oh, crap I said, fine, I'll get along. I mean, if it's if it's this or that or their bullshit, I'll, I'll put up with their bullshit, fine. Mm -hmm. And they went to this church in the university district, which is, you know, like it sounds, that's where, you know, the university is, all the, all the hip uh, young people and everything. And this what? church was like right next to the University of Washington and it was called The Vineyard, which mm -hmm. I've since learned is a chain and uh, you know so they you can look up are they the ones that do all the music and stuff they yeah yeah they're very music heavy uh, uh they also run um or, or maybe they don't run it specifically but they're heavily involved in the ex-gay movement mm -hmm. I, I think i know exactly what you're talking about because mm -hmm. our church used to sing their music <laughs> oh yeah yeah i'm sure that was probably it like you know and the first thing that like they they talked about besides the music when I went to that church with them um, was the the father the foster father of the mm -hmm. house I was in was like well we help people to not be gay anymore and we yep. help cure them of their sin and you know at the time like I told you I was the horniest thing you ever saw and I was mm -hmm. like I was into guys and I was pretty sure I was into girls, uh -huh. but you know, I wasn't like, I wasn't real sure. So I was just mm -hmm. kind of keeping quiet about it. And I was like, oh shit, this guy, I better not let this guy know that like, <laughs> that's anything like it's ever crossed my mind. Cause they'll uh -huh. send me to one of those re-education, like uh -huh. crazy things. God knows what they're doing, you know? Mm -hmm. And he, he was like, do you see Bill over there way across the room in the blue shirt? Okay, he used to be gay, but we fixed him. We helped mm. cure him through the love of Jesus. I was like, mm. what the hell kind of crazy are you people spouting? Mm -hmm. I was like, I can't believe like you didn't, because even back then I knew that it, you're born that way, that it's mm -hmm. not, it, it's not some kind of like, 
lifestyle choice. I mean, yeah. you know, that was 18 years ago. And, we, yeah. and most rational people knew that this wasn't something that you choose. Wow. And yep. the music was slightly more hip than mm. like your average um your average churchy rock you know yeah. uh -huh. but i'll tell you that it's still i mean you experienced it there's still yeah. kind of like a with the with the christian music it's it's almost like they're like 10 to 20 years behind current <laughs> music sound you know yeah. it'll be like like you see those commercials for the for the CDs of the of the church music, and it's like right. our God is an awesome God, <laughs> and you're like that sounds like an '80s love ballad, and uh -huh. this is you know 2010, so y'all are a little behind. <laughs> um, and you know they they did that thing like while the music's playing, most of the people they got their hands up in the air, and mm -hmm. they're like they got their eyes closed and they're mm -hmm. and they're singing, and they want to show you like how hip they are, and they have you know some guy will come up with like an electric guitar and he'll <laughs> sit and play, and you know, and then they had the um the the church youth group that mm -hmm. you know we'd all go sit like up in a in a room somewhere and. Um, I learned, of course, later that this is a big hallmark of of, of churches like the, the Vineyard or, you know, I guess you'd call them evangelical. I just called them like new age hippie bullcrap, mm -hmm. like mixed in with old stodgy conservative. Like I was like, I have no idea what to call this. But these people are like, I touch God and he touches me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was all, wow, these people are weird. And yeah. we we'd be sitting in the youth group and like the the lady that ran youth group which uh, now i know she's probably was no more than like 18 or 19 herself mm -hmm. she said she wanted to go on a church ski trip and mm -hmm. like she was 20 dollars short and mm. she was you know praying and praying to god to get her you know a way to go on this ski trip because it was with the you know it was with the other church members and she really mm. wanted to go and it was going to be a magical experience with god on the mountain and mm. you know and she said you know that one one day that somebody came up to her and said you know i just feel like you really need this and gave her 20 bucks mm -hmm. and that was one of those points i remember going I am just sick of hearing this <laughs> crap. Uh <-huh. laughs> I mean, does this lady really think with like everything that goes on in the world that mm -hmm. that this this magical creature would give uh -huh. her twenty dollars? Like, mm -hmm. you know? and I had just come off the streets. You know, I had. I had like carried everything I owned in a backpack. I'd not eaten for days at a time. I'd, mm -hmm. you know, sat on the ground out in the cold. I'd done mm -hmm. all this shit and I'd gone, you know, and I, I wasn't even thinking of myself as much as I was thinking like there is, like I was kind of okay. You know, I wasn't mm -hmm. dead. I wasn't horribly ill, but there's children all over the world who are starving and sick mm -hmm. and being blown up by landmines and, you know, God knows whatever else. And, and, this lady thinks that her God cares about her $20 to mm -hmm. go on the freaking ski trip. You know, it's one of right. those things. I was just so upset. Yeah. Well, can you, can you pinpoint any particular moment or any particular, you know, thing that you were taught that, that was like the breaking point that was like, okay, you know what? I am now, uh, you know, an atheist or, you know, like just kind of what was that shift like and what was going on? Well, I actually had a pretty easy shift because, you know, when when I was a kid and I was having those first, no, there's no such thing as God thoughts. You know, there was a lot of doubt in me. Mm -hmm. But over the years, it just kind of like it was it was little things like, you know, the twenty dollar story and, mm -hmm. you know, the the just learning like more about you know science and the way the universe was created and or not created um mm -hmm. just like it, i think it was just more of a gradual build up of things mm -hmm. little by little by little that i learned that you know it wasn't until i don't know probably like 6 or 7 years ago that i it even occurred to me to use the word atheist like mm -hmm. you know i would have told you no, I don't believe in God. That's, you know, that's stupid. Why would I believe in God? But, mm -hmm. you know, the word atheist didn't didn't occur to me. And, you know, I'm sure there was some unconscious um, 
like the thought that you know that's a horrible word people hate that word and people don't yeah. don't, don't like you if you're that um and i can't remember consciously thinking that but i'm sure that was probably there yeah yeah and i'm I was, sure i was very lucky though because you know it i didn't have you know a uh, a, a hard transition because mm -hmm. i i guess i just wasn't really that in i wasn't sunk in Mm -hmm. to religion you know for many of the people we talk to it's it's like crawling out of quicksand mm -hmm. and you know it, and it's hard and mm -hmm. painful and and horrible but i uh i guess i lucked out it and i think a big part of that is that you know seattle is a pretty secular place mm -hmm. not a lot of real religious people around which is nice right right so what has it been like um co like coming out to friends and family you know, I told my mom, and my mom's been um, pretty heavily involved in AA um, mm -hmm. ever since, like, I was an early teenager when my parents split up. You know, that was kind of a catalyst. She was all, okay, I'm kind of messed up. She drank for a while, pretty heavy, and then went to AA, like, right after that. So, mm -hmm. um, so she's, I think that kind of actually mellowed her because she hadn't been going to church like mm -hmm. since too much earlier than that and like she um you know the the aa thing they tend to kind of focus more on the whole higher power you know they keep it pretty non-denominational it's not really serious although i still think that higher power thing is kind of bs and, uh -huh. and i think it's detrimental to people who are trying mm -hmm. to recover but whatever okay i mm -hmm. won't knock it too much um but uh i told her I don't know within the last couple of years I said something like you know I'm not going to be going to any Easter services because I'm an atheist and and you know I realized that it needed to be said we were kind of on the topic anyways and she just kind of tisk tisked me I was, like, mm -hmm. I was like that's not a reaction you expect coming out as an atheist she goes, well uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know that you can say for sure that there's no gods or anything so you yeah. know you can't really believe that <laughs> you know? are you tisk tisking me what <laughs> but um you know that that worked out okay and you know joining joining social organizations uh meetup groups uh you know there's a couple of great groups here uh, seattle and tacoma atheists both have meetups and we go to go to the events and hang out with people or we go see people speak or we watch movies you know mm -hmm. it's um it's in general it's it's not a big deal but there is a certain contingent of people who get really upset when they find out you're an atheist and mm -hmm. i'm not sure what to describe them like but this this encounter kind of embodies it like mm -hmm. you know she listened to a few episodes of the podcast and mm -hmm. she was like the things that you guys are saying about Christians are not mm -hmm. true about all Christians. And I don't think you guys should talk about us like that and blah, 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 you know, and, um, and, and the people who like, you know, they want to, they want to debate you. There was another, another coworker who, and you know, you've listened, like, we're not, we're not running around going, all Christians are stupid and all Christians are this and all, you know, we're like, yeah. we're really, cause you know, most of, most of the people we talk to are ex Christians. So nobody's going around, like, you know, making these big generalizations or being insulting. We're, we're sensitive to it because it. most of us have come from that background. Most of right. us have been, and you know, you don't insult yourself and the people that you love. Right. Well, and people are just telling their personal stories. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, they're not sitting there going, you know, I was a retard. No, yeah, <laughs> they're just right. like, I believed something different. Now I believe something different, you know, uh -huh. um, but like we ended up in this long, long conversation over beer, like with mm. a couple of guys that Rich worked with that, like, honestly did not believe one of them didn't believe that dinosaurs existed uh -huh. and like that's not something that you run into in seattle uh -huh. very often like you don't run into people that think the earth is six thousand years old here, but, <laughs> right you know and they wanted to argue simply because we're atheists mm -hmm. not because we said anything to them or did anything or even had conversation with them mm -hmm. they we had run into them like at a at a bar near where rich works and 
you know, just in conversation, you know, I'm not sure where it came up, but they like asked or, or, it, you know, the, the opportunity came up and, and we just said, oh, no, we're, we're atheists. We don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. And that sparks like, you know, an hour and a half long where they want to like, you know, they go, well, you just want to sin or, <laughs> you know, you don't want to, you don't want to like follow God's law and, and you don't want to have to be accountable. And, you know, I mean, yeah. is it? People, there's certain very, but it, those are rare. They're rare. Mm -hmm. Not too many people do that. Yeah. But there are certain people who are very upset that mm -hmm. atheists exist. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think it. I think it might it might shake the worldview a little bit. You know that yeah. when everybody you know believes. Oh, Karen's husband. What, sweetie? At the. Oh God, Karen's husband at the reunion. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh man yeah rich was just sitting outside the door and goes, oh, you have to talk karen is this lady that rich went to school with in in high school and boyfriend girlfriend in fifth grade. you guys were boyfriend girlfriend in fifth grade oh that's adorable <laughs> that is very cute so mm -hmm. last summer in july rich and i went down to texas to go and uh you know, I hadn't met his family yet because we, you know, we had just got married and, um, you know, I'd never been to Texas. That's a whole nother world for me. <laughs> wow. And, um, you know, the 30th high school reunion was just icing on the cake. Rich was like, I get to show off my young hot wife who was born <laughs> the year that we graduated high school. And <laughs> so, you know, we were, we were looking forward to it. And I wanted to like meet the people he grew up with because... Mm -hmm where where I'm from in it in my maybe it's my personal like ideas about things or maybe it's just you know the area I I'm not yeah it, it, he's from a small town and I'm from a, like a lot larger town and you know I don't keep in touch with people I went to school with I don't go to reunions <laughs> nobody I know has known me since I was a kid except for like two people you know mm -hmm. I don't but Marshall's a very small town, so everybody everybody knows each other. Everybody's a lot of people still there. A lot of people all up in everybody's business. Yes. Oh my God! So that's what leads to <laughs> this. We go to the reunion. We walk in the ballroom, and the first thing that strikes me is we, this is like the second floor of a big old building, one of those old ballrooms, and the place is laid out so that like you know there's a bunch of like big round tables all over the place, and then there's like food and some speakers at one end of the room and mm. I walk in first Rich is behind me and I just stop and I just turn around and look at Rich and I go really because what <laughs> I saw when I walked in he had warned me but I didn't think it would be so obvious I walked oh. in and literally one third of the room was all the black people and oh. the other two thirds was all the white people they oh, were wow. not sitting together they were barely socializing on the edges of where the two groups were mm -hmm. it was and you know i'm from a place where you know people you know we're not overt in like mm -hmm. in in things like that we don't divide ourselves up you know mm -hmm. and you know as as liberal and awesome as seattle is everybody's so terribly nervous about race relations because we're really liberal and we're really afraid we're going to offend everybody you know <laughs> <laughs> so you know i'm not going to say like i'm totally immune from those social influences i don't i don't know i'm probably an idiot sometimes about things but to walk into a place where literally people are segregated i've never seen such a thing mm -hmm. it was i was like what this mm -hmm. is 2010. This, <laughs> I didn't just walk into like 1954, did I? Mm. But that's what that whole town was like. So anyways, um, we're sitting down. We go, we sit on the black side of the room because Rich played football <laughs> with most of those guys. Uh -huh. You know, that's where a lot of his buddies were. And those are the people he wanted to see, not all of the other bastards <laughs> right <laughs> and, uh, so we're sitting over there and this this blonde guy comes up and starts talking to rich and the little music's kind of loud it's hard to hear and he says to rich um so you're not preaching anymore is that right 
And Rich looks at him like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> this guy is Karen's husband. Rich has never met Karen's husband. You what? know, Rich didn't go to school with this guy. This guy didn't know Rich when he was preaching and doesn't know Rich now. So it's wow. it's a stupid question. You know, you're not still preaching, are you? Right? Because uh-huh. who the hell are you? And Rich says, well, no, I'm not, which I think you probably already knew. And the guy uh-huh. goes, well, tell me this. Did you ever really know the love of Jesus Christ through our Lord and blah, blah. And Rich just looks at him and goes, dude, I preached that shit for 20 years. Of course I knew it. And I was like, did you ever really know it? Mm-hmm. Like, basically, he was throwing out that no true Scotsman thing. Like, oh, well, you know, if you're not a Christian now, you never really were. So uh-huh. we end up like going out in the hallway and it's me and Rich versus blonde guy. Uh-huh. And blonde guy's got some issues because one of the earliest things he brings up is like something about how like the secular world and people just want to like sin and the the homosexuals taking over society uh, and uh, uh. like you know of uh, things that uh, once again as a seattleite i am not used to hearing people say that like that has anything to do with being evil you know yeah and so his wife is kind of just standing there and I started talking about how because there is no God life is more precious life is more wonderful Mm -hmm. the luck that we have to be here to have this life and to you know take as much pleasure out of it as we can to Mm -hmm. love and be loved the the things that I believe are the most important and are more important when there's no God than if Mm -hmm. this is just a staging area for the afterlife Mm -hmm. And yeah. this lady, um, she she looks up at me and she has the most terrified look on her face. Her <laughs> her eyes are wide open and her eyelids are fluttering. She's blinking like she's staring at like the scariest thing she ever saw. And she is horrified and she says, I just can't imagine a world with no God in it. <laughs> and she has to like walk away because she's so upset. I'm like, I'm in the middle of telling her how beautiful and how lucky we are and how wonderful life is and how much I I love the people around me and the things I get to do and how they're more precious. And she Mm -hmm. is terrified. Uh, It is so funny. I was like, I've never encountered that. Like I, the fear. And, and I really think, I think that's what's going on when people are so, like they have to like try and like talk you out of your atheism if they find out you're an atheist uh-huh. it's because they're afraid of a, of the idea of there not being a god and they have to kind of poke at it they gotta mm-hmm. both like find out what you're about and why you would think that and they have to like tell you why you're wrong mm-hmm. <laughs> because it can't go it can't do that somebody like thinks some there's no god because that's too frightening for them right yeah yeah anyways i'm sorry that went on forever <laughs> no that's a good story though <laughs> well my la- basically my last um thing that i want you to talk about is what what do you feel is the biggest um i guess problem with uh religion and society or you know christian churches in sp- uh, specifically mm, that's a tough one mm-hmm. there's so much to choose from uh-huh. <laughs> yes <laughs> um I think our biggest problem that comes about because of religion is the fear and hatred of the quote unquote other. Mm -hmm. When you are in your church with your people, everybody else who is not there is not saved, is not like, you know, having a relationship with God, is not doing things the way you do them or, or the way that you or thinking things the way that you think them Mm -hmm. that makes them the other Mm -hmm. and the other is not a human almost Mm -hmm. you know the uh the the way that muslims are being demonized by Mm -hmm. the christian right right now Mm -hmm. that is wholly wholly all about the other 
they're mm-hmm. scary because they believe something different. Mm-hmm. They sometimes they live in different countries that we don't know a lot about mm-hmm. as, you know, your average dumb American. Mm-hmm. Um, so we you know, we collectively fear them because there are extremists. Mm-hmm. But we ignore the extremists that are in our own groups. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I really think that that the process of making somebody an other is yeah. the worst thing because once somebody is not human, not like you, not worthy of your respect and humanity and love, mm-hmm. then you can do anything to them. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. a scary thing. Yeah. Yeah, I like that line. Or uh, that line, what you just said. We ignore the extremists of our own groups, mm-hmm. and I think that that is a, I mean, definitely a big issue, especially with uh, Christianity in America. Mm-hmm. Because you know? everybody can always say, like, you know, they can they can give it the no true Scotsman argument. Mm-hmm. You know, people will say the the Koran burning guy uh, Terry Jones in mm-hmm. Florida. They go, well, that guy is not really a Christian because. I wouldn't do that as Mm -hmm. a Christian and the Christians I know don't do that. Mm -hmm. So he's, you know, he's not doing it right. He's Mm -hmm. not not one of us. They otherize him in a way of like to excuse themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I like, uh, I think you guys may have mentioned it on a podcast a while Mm -hmm. ago, but I I really enjoy um, what Sam Harris always says about how um, even moderate Christians kind of provide this blanket for the extremists to hide under Mm -hmm. and you know when you don't call that out you know like you know what you're saying when you're kind of ignoring the extremists in your own group yeah that's that's just basically giving them a license to keep doing what they're doing yeah yep absolutely Mm -hmm. because people can look around themselves and they can say you know i don't know anybody that's like fred phelps Mm -hmm. and so most of the people I know are good, calm, moderate, whatever, yes. non-hating Christians. And mm-hmm. so then they can they can say, well, that guy is not doing it right. But right. at the same time, there are degrees in between that. There's mm-hmm. churches that, you know, I think there's a Lutheran churches that like ordain women as priests or is it Episcopal or whatever. Mm-hmm. Okay. And those people are like way, way on like the moderate liberal chill end. And then yeah. there's like the Terry Joneses and the Fred Phelps way on the hating end. Yeah. And that all, everything in between falls under the Christian blanket. So yeah. we don't really know how many are the Terry Jones type versus the liberal type. Exactly. And I think people are rather reluctant to share. They they know, like, sort of like the Mormons, they don't talk about how they didn't ordain or have black members for, mm-hmm. like, up until, I think it was the 70s. Mm-hmm. Mormons never talk about that now because they know that that's not right. Mm-hmm. The, the Christians who, you know, don't like gay people mm-hmm. or try to cure them or whatever... Most of them, they don't talk about it because they know the rest of society doesn't think it's right. Mm-hmm. And so there's no way to tell if there's a Christian who's doing harm with their beliefs or a Christian who's not doing harm with their mm-hmm. beliefs. We don't know how to distinguish between them. Now, if they had different names, it'd be cool. It'd be like, we're the, we're the fag bashers and right. then <laughs> we're, we're the inclusive loving people. Okay, great. You have two different names. But when you have the one name, you can't tell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is basically all that I have, and uh, I that was great. I appreciate uh, you know here, especially I think what really draws me to your story is the kind of looking at the sexual side and and how that has really religion has really hurt, especially women mm-hmm. um, when it comes to our sexuality and that kind of thing. Absolutely. Um, I I know in the um, part of my you know part of my research into um black culture i know you know of course black culture is kind of known for being excessively homophobic Mm -hmm. but what people don't realize too is that you know kind of this lack of talking about things has made like sexual uh, stds just so ridiculous like black women are just so ridiculously you know over the top in terms of the the rate of std just way 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 beyond any other 
group. Yeah, the risk factors are, you know, I, I can't remember exactly, but they're, you know, they're astronomical compared to yeah. other groups. Yeah, they are. Unbelievable. Yeah. I wonder, like, if any of that, like, how much is correlated to, you know, religion, whether because there's, you know, higher religiosity rates within right. people of, you know, black, Hispanics, um, mm -hmm. Philippine, Filipinos, um, you know, whether how much of that is correlated with the negative ideas about sex, because one of the major problems is, is if you don't prepare for sex, if you don't admit that you're planning on having it, i.e. Mm -hmm. by birth control or protection or any of that, mm -hmm. it's less of a sin to, oops, I, you know, I did it, yeah. I had sex, and then, you know, okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll pray for forgiveness or whatever later. That, so it's, it's actually less of a sin to, to do it that way. But if you plan you on it, accidentally. <laughs> yep. Yep. But if you plan for it, it's like premeditated murder. You know, you get a higher penalty, <laughs> only yep. it's a higher, you know, I guess mm -hmm. it's, it's a greater chance of hell or something. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how it works. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, it's also possible that there's like other, you know, it's other cultural factors, but that's something that worries me a lot with the cultural mm -hmm. discourse about Planned Parenthood right now. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm like, do not take away like the only outlet a lot of people have for learning yeah. about STDs and learning yeah. about sex. I mean, it's really painful they to watch. saved my ass so many times when I was like in my 20s and, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the free condoms, they give you, you know, pap smears and your mm -hmm. birth control and, and your STD testing. I mean, I cannot count the number of times that yeah. they helped me out. Yeah. And if it weren't for them, I would have kids. I would, I would totally have kids. I would have accidental kids. They gave uh -huh. me an abortion when I was younger and I'm, you know, it's hard to, I'm, I'm trying to get to this point where I don't like cringe at mentioning mm -hmm. it you know mm -hmm. be like yeah. it was one of the best things that i have ever done because mm -hmm. i was like 19 i was messed up you know i wasn't wasn't like all like doing drugs and going crazy mm -hmm. but you know i had crappy ass retail jobs mm -hmm. i you know didn't have a steady boyfriend um you know, who had like a roommate and lived in the basement of like some crappy rental house. And, right. Would know. have been just the worst possible situation to bring a child into. Yeah. You know, I would have been going to the food bank and, and, you know, living in like cold, mildewy, like mm -hmm. lame conditions with, you know, and I, I grew up like kind of poor among like really people who had a lot of money. They, they were like mm -hmm. the upper middle class. So, mm -hmm. I was acutely aware of the things that I experienced being like the poor kid, like my mom would make our clothes a lot of the time and I would get a lot of shit, you know, mm -hmm. they'd be like, where'd you get that ugly ass shirt? <laughs> my right. mom made it because we're yeah. poor, because it was cheap. So, yeah. you know, I knew that was like, that was not the kind of, of situation I wanted to like bring kids into and I'm, I don't want kids. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I might have, I might have like said at the time, like, you know, if, if conditions were right, I'd be down, but mm -hmm. you know, conditions are right right now. And I still, I don't want kids. I'm just, yeah. I, don't have that, I don't have that urge. So, yeah. you know, what and do you there's do? nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And if you were in certain types of religion, they'd be telling you, you better have some children. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I would be obligated, like not just obligated, mm -hmm. but like you don't have kids, you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You go to time out, young lady, and get yourself <laughs> impregnated. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, like I said, that's pretty much it for me. So, you know, I don't know where we just go straight into yeah. you yeah, interview me. Rich and Thank you for listening to the Living After Faith podcast, a podcast designed to help you as you leave religion and move forward with your life. We're the official podcast of RecoveringReligionist.com, a recovery group founded by Dr. Daryl Ray, the author of The God Virus. We welcome your feedback. In fact, we want your feedback. And you can find us, phone numbers, email addresses. Go to LivingAfterFaith.com at Facebook.com slash LivingAfterFaith and follow us on Twitter at Laugh With Me, L-A-F With Me. The music for today's show is provided by Morrison's Prophecy. See livingafterfaith.com for a link to more music from Morrison's Prophecy. I'm Rich Lyons. Come laugh with me.